The Washington State Cougs moved to 8-1 and one after a win against Utah State in Pullman this coming week. They will be heading to New Mexico in an effort to move to 9-1 and one and keep their college football playoff hopes alive. WCU is currently ranked 18th by the College Football Playoff Committee, and as we get into in this episode, WCU potentially can use a loophole to add a 13th game to their schedule to help bolster their resume and give them a better shot at making the playoffs. In this episode, we recap the Utah State matchup, we get into the preview against New Mexico, and we also cover a rumor that John Mateer has already been offered a million dollar NIL by another school. But before we get into the podcast, this episode is sponsored by Black Label Supplements, who are a third party tested athlete approved supplement company here in the Pacific Northwest. I personally use them for all of my supplementation pre-workout, post-workout, creatine, protein, you name it. Check out blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And as always, if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, I'm actually a full-time mortgage broker during the day, so make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, the Couch GM, as it's my goal to help as many fellow Coug alum get into the home of their dreams. If you'd like to get in touch, I'll have a link in the description of this video that you can use, and I'd be happy to jump on a call. And with that, let's get into the podcast. The Cougs handled business at home in Pullman against Utah State. They finished the job getting a win 49-28. They are now ranked 18th by the College Football Playoff Committee. And Dylan sent a tweet today, which is pretty wild. Sickos Committee, which is a college football-focused Twitter account, put out this information, which is a little loophole of a rule for teams that might not be in the, the conference championship game. In order to boost their resume, they state the Cougs are seven spots away from scraping into the playoffs as an at-large. They can't get in as an auto bid. They would need a lot of help, though, without a 13th game. Fun fact, they can schedule a 13th game on conference championship game week or Army-Navy week, according to NCAA regulations. It just has to take place in non-continental USA which is Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, etc. This is a wild loophole, and apparently, Dylan, you mentioned that Nevada is already working this into their schedule to help out their resume. Yeah, Nevada used that loophole this year. They've got a 13th game, but I don't know if the loopholes just meant it, it's staying here at Hawaii. It's got to be at Hawaii. Lastly, the rule helps Hawaii. The Rainbow Warriors have trouble enticing non-conference teams to make the trek over the open water, so the rule was created to help appease opponents and make Hawaii's scheduling process a bit easier. So I, I don't know how feasible this is, but I mean, if this is a rule that was in the books and you take a look at WSU, obviously they knew what type of team they had coming into this season, what type of schedule. So I, I would hope that this is something that maybe his on the fire or have the coals burning because when you take a look at this year you had Appalachian State and Liberty play each other the week the hurricane hit North Carolina so those two schools only have 11 games so why not get them on the line then you have your your two loss ACC schools you know you could possibly hit up Louisville you could hit up a Pittsburgh you could hit up South Carolina how sweet would that be nine and three South Carolina versus an 11 and one WSU team that maybe winner gets into the playoff I don't know how feasible this thing actually is it'd be interesting to see if like Jamie of Coog fan or somebody that's in these Monday pressers with Jake Dickert brings this question up uh, in terms of this loophole so I hope that's asked next week you know, I'll maybe shoot Jamie a text to to ask him that question. But yeah, I mean, how how sweet would that be? You you go out to Hawaii and you have a one game little spin-off and you're going to get great ratings. I mean, if it's if it's the Army Navy week, week after the conference championships, well, there's only two games on the docket and uh, you get a lot of eyeballs on that Saturday game. The Cougs will take any route possible to get into the playoffs and a follow-up question to to this post was would they be able to just go up to Vancouver and play at the BC Lions Stadium or something? And the re response was, it needs to be on U.S. soil. Again, the rule was made to encourage teams to schedule Hawaii and a theoretical future Alaskan team. Also, uh, a few other amazing comments. The 9-3 Gamecocks versus the 11-1 Cougs playing a neutral site game in Guam for a college football playoff berth would be awesome. Also, Wazoo versus Oregon State again, but it's played at our favorite Alaskan field in negative 30 degree weather where the sun doesn't even come up. If we're thinking about Guam. Let's 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 go back to Hollywood. A few good men, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson. You can't handle the truth. How about a few good teams in Guam? South Carolina versus versus Washington State. 
And then one more tweet, Wazoo versus Oregon State in the Pac-12 championship in Hawaii, kicking off at a midnight Eastern with a playoff spot in the line would be the most electric game of the year. Yeah, unfortunately, a four and se- eight or a five and seven Oregon State team is not going to do the job there. But you take it, take a look at Liberty. They've got a decent record this year. That'd be a good game. Kadon Slovis, a hell of a quarterback too, the Tennessee transfer. I uh, got kicked out of Tennessee because he had a gun on campus, but you know, we'll... <laughs> We'll overlook that for for some resume builder. So don't count the cues out quite yet. There are still ways that that they can get in this, but the next step is going to be moving to nine and one against New Mexico, which we'll preview here in just a moment. Now moving into a bit of the recap against the Utah State Aggies at home, the Cougs got the win, forty nine to twenty eight. They were close to keeping it forty nine twenty one until Derek Jamison broke out a seventy two yard run with 41 seconds left on the clock for a touchdown to move it to 49-28. Overall, the Cougs had 482 total yards. Utah State had 395 total yards. They got two turnovers on the day. John Mateer had four total touchdowns in the air. Wayshawn Parker broke it out for 11 carries, 149 yards, and two touchdowns, averaging 13.5. We'll get into his injury status in just a moment. He did go to the locker room. But uh, Dylan, what were your initial thoughts on this game? Johnny football does it again, three straight weeks without turning the football over. That's 78 straight pass attempts without an interception. So that's what you want to see. He's at 22 touchdowns, six interceptions on the year. And then Wayshawn Parker, as you said it, you know, 11 carries, 149 yards, had that 75 yard touchdown run to open up the second half to really kind of alleviate any issues that we were thinking that might arise against Utah State. Obviously, Went out. Coach Dicker this week uh, has, has said that they expect him to play uh, this weekend. So good news there. Uh, there was a video of a targeting call, uh, a targeting that was n- not called. It was egregious. It was on, I, and I think it's the play where Wayshawn maybe got hurt. Maybe, he, you know, I, I hate to assume I'm not a doctor or anything, but I mean, it was helmet to helmet, and you saw Wayshon's helmet also hit the ground pretty hard. So hopefully he's not in some sort of concussion protocol, but it's good to hear Dickert thinks he's going to be able to play this week. But the one thing that really pissed me off, Connor, was at the end, you know, you've gone 59 minutes with playing your starters and your first team guys, and you have a 49-21 lead, and then you, then you empty the bench. I, I just didn't understand that. At that point, just play them the final 60 minutes. You know, you need resume building wins and 49-21 looks a lot better than 49-28. You know, giving up 28 points to a a two and seven Utah State team might not look good with the committee. But, you know, as we kind of transfer into where the college football rankings are, we've still, you know, it's nice to see that these two loss ACC schools are behind us. That's the only edge we have currently in the rankings. So I thought it was a, a good performance. The Cougs came out of a, you know, a bye week and, uh, you know, handled business. And, you know, that's what you're supposed to do at this point. It's win games. You've got three left on the schedule and you're going to have back-to-back road games here over the next two weeks playing against a New Mexico team that has a pretty good quarterback in Dampier there. You know, he said, I think he's second overall in rushing yards amongst quarterbacks. John is where sixth. Yep. So you got a top 10 matchup of, of dual threat QBs. I think some, you know, diehard Cougar football fans are looking at this game is okay. Is this the trap game? Cause you obviously you're going to have the Oregon state game, you know, the, the remaining two PAC 12 schools, it's going to be at Corvallis. You, you hope this is not a game where the Cougs are looking ahead in terms of, you know, a, a, a better opponent in Oregon state. Obviously they've been hampered with injuries on the defensive line and, and throughout the team. You got to go in there and you got to take care of business. Uh, you know, Utah, this Wyoming put up, over 40 points on this New Mexico team. You hope you can get out of there with a 40 burger and and winning by, you know, 21 plus. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, agree. First off, talking about Utah State, that ending, it's like you're at the point in the season where you have to throttle teams, put up as many points as possible, hold them to as few as points as possible if you want a shot at anything at, you know at the best possible ending of your season i believe it was the head coach for oregon that you know w- after throttling a team he walks over shakes the head coach's hand like hey i just you know this is just what we have to do and teams like oregon teams that are in the top 12 they have to continue to, to put the pedal down similar to what the Cougs have to do the rest of this year and really show no mercy for the full 60 minutes and then moving over to this matchup against new mexico as you mentioned it will be at at new mexico and, and it will be featuring the uh, top 10 matchup of mobile quarterbacks, dual threat quarterbacks. Devin Dampier, as you mentioned, 110 attempts on the year, 872 total rushing yards. He is second 
among all quarterbacks in the country on the year. He has been sacked just five times this season, and he has 334 rushing yards in his last two games. Yeah, 13 rushing touchdowns as well, uh, 111 carries, 858 yards, a 7.7 average. Their lead back, Eli Sanders, 835 yards. So it's a prominent rushing attack that you're going to see with New Mexico. But you take a look at the quarterback stats. He's got 11. He's got more interceptions than touchdowns, 11 touchdowns, 12 picks. So this is where you're hoping the Coos can continue this plus turnover margin that they've been really keeping their butts with one loss on this year you go back to the fresno state game a few other games as well so you know this bronco mendenhall he's been a a division one uh coach for years you know so you've seen dickert and this staff get out schemed at times this season so you hope that the scheme is set you hope the you know, you still see more blitzes from the Schmetting defense over the past couple of weeks. You've seen more blitz packages. They're a better team when they blitz, that's for sure. So, yeah, it's going to be another, uh, another, you know, hey, take care of business type game. Move on to the next week and hope chaos continues to, uh, you know, happen in front of you because it's 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 happening. You know, unfortunately for for us, Georgia lost to Ole Miss, and you see some of these three lost teams. Heather Dinkich came out and said that. You know, a three loss Georgia because of their strength of schedule will be considered. But if Ole Miss takes another loss, you can count them out. You know, and, and John Wilner, he he voted for WS or he voted for LSU over Washington State. He's got like two or three three loss teams. He's ranked ahead of Washington State. And, you know, some fans will always say he's been a hater. I don't. But there's uh, a few of those out there in the country. <laughs> yeah. Now, where New Mexico struggled is defensively similar to Utah State. You know, Utah State was able to put up a ton of yardage, but their defense is what lacks. Same with New Mexico. The uh, the Lobos have turned over their opponent just 10 times and are allowing 38.3 points and 477.2 yards per game. Both rank number 130 in the country out of 133 teams. As you remember from last week's Utah State preview, they were pretty close to dead last as well in defensive rankings. This information is coming from cubefan.com. If you're not already subscribed there, go check them out. They always have a great early preview of the upcoming matchup, which is live on, on Mondays. A really great preview there, so go check them out. And then as it mentions also, as and as you stated, Dampier, his passing can be erratic, but there's nothing in, inconsistent about what he does on the run. He's very mobile, and this article also mentions that the Cougs are going to have to put a spy on him in this game and potentially linebacker Buda Alukta, who is purely due to his speed. So we'll see how the how the Cougs decide to take down Dampier in New Mexico, but this is a game. Go out there, take care of business, put your foot down, keep your starters in all 60 minutes, limit the passing, limit the rushing, and, and see if you can make this as lopsided as possible. Also, you know, earlier this week on the Coug Crimson Cougar podcast with, uh, you know, Puck, and that whole crew, uh, Paul Sorensen, you know, big time Coog, came out and said that John Matier already has a million dollar offer from an unknown team for next season. And again, you know, I through some of my my sources, I've I've heard that Northern Quest is anywhere from two hundred and fifty thousand to three hundred thousand in terms of nil nil this year with the option to renew that and, and, and go bigger. Obviously, hey, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. They they also brought up a good aspect is, hey, if you go to a Texas A&M or a Ole Miss or a school of that aspect, well, they're, they're paying another three quarter quarterbacks big time money to come in and and compete for that job as well. So, you know, you look at Mateer, obviously, hey, we were his only big power offer. We believe in him, in him first. The offense is tailored around him this year. So if he's comfortable being here and we can get that NIL dollar and, and have a good sales pitch for a hometown discount, that's where that's where you hope, hope to see it happen. And honestly, I think at this point, I think if Dickert goes, Mateer goes. So I, I think it's we lose both or we keep them both next season. And we had talked in the past about how how long we think Mateer will stay in Pullman. And my argument was for him staying through two years and then going somewhere else, most likely, because this is his first year starting as a college quarterback. There's been a lot of bumps. There's been a lot of growth that he has seen. As you mentioned, this this offense is perfect for what his style is. You get run it back next year with Mateer, with Sean, with all of these guys, and he could put up even bigger numbers. He could take a bigger stride. And then after next season, he could potentially, you know, decide to go to whatever, whatever university with much more growth under his belt. 
and he has a higher opportunity of winning one of those starting jobs when he does transfer. You know, uh, also Trent Bray, head coach at Oregon State, was asked this year in a weekly presser, how, how much money does their NIL collective need? And he said millions, you know, so yeah, that's probably anywhere from two to five million dollars. So you look at that, you got these big time SEC Big Ten rosters that have 20 million dollar rosters. Cougs have a match campaign for 400K with the, the Cougar Collective right now. That's nearly there. But, I mean, it's it just goes to show you how much money is is now involved in these NIL collectives. And, you know, I've heard through some some channels that our, our collective is in a good spot. It always can be better. Let's be real. It, it always can be better. And, hey, drink your Crimson Lager. Drink your Crimson Coffee. Be an 1890 Club donor. I mean, with Cougs, we're, we're going to have to to chip in and force, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts in terms of the NIL collective. So, again, if you're not an 1890 member, get on it. And if you want to see guys like Sean Parker, John Mateer, Issa Pole, you know, come back next year. Well, this is this is the new realm of college sports. So the good thing, though, is, is that you're seeing big time partnerships. Northern Quest Casino, it, it's a huge partnership and just goes to show you how great that football program is doing because Northern Quest, in my opinion, they'd, they'd probably be rather tied to Gonzaga basketball as opposed to, to Washington State football. So it's good to see Washington State forcing the issue and getting big time corporation dollars, whether it's from a, you know, a casino or, or whatever it may be. Uh, go lose some money at Northern Quest. All right, and our big journalist tweet of the week was from Theo Lawson, which states, the go Cougs that Nigel Burton slipped at the end of his third quarter CW interview with Jake Dickert wasn't a great look. Dylan, what are your thoughts? This is our big J tweet of the week. Theo's a big J. You know, he covers Gonzaga basketball, used to cover Washington State football. Theo, nobody cares, okay? The the CW was the only TV partner that wanted us. You got to remember, Theo, we got kicked to the curb. Us in Oregon State, you know what? And, and I'd like to see Old Crimson with the reply. We enjoyed it. Yeah, they are a Pac-12 channel. They have two Pac-12 teams. I could care less about that. And obviously, hey, you know, journalistic integrity, can't you're in the, in the press box. At this point, they're our only partner. C-Dub's on the train. They're on the Wazoo train. And Nigel Burton, I'm glad he's on it too. All right, the former, the former Husky. You know, he's he's long stated his love for the Pac-12, and when you have guys like Nigel Burton coming back from the Pac-12 Network, Mikey Am, um, obviously in the halftime show, yeah, they're gonna be a little biased to Pac to the Pac-12. And one res one response to him was, if it was after a basketball game and they said "Go Zags," you and Bad and I, so it's a, all of a all of a bias going on. And then our social media of the week was a tweet from Dylan from our last week's episode of the podcast in which we had a clip from Jake Dickert stating that he seems to be fed up with the lack of support in Martin Stadium. He put that out on Twitter and a lot of people were responding to him with their reasons why they haven't been going to Martin Stadium games. There's various reasons. One is the strength of schedule this year. There's the fact that Pullman is kind of in the middle of nowhere. So when referencing how so many Coug fans travel to San Diego, but they won't travel to Pullman. That's another reason for it. There is potential pricing that like going to Pullman is more expensive than a weekend in San Diego. There's the fact that alcohol isn't currently sold in the stadium. There's a lot of reasons that you can add to it. Dylan, what were, what were your takeaways and some of the big r responses there? There's valid reasons. There really is. There are valid reasons. I understand it is expensive to get out, but you got to realize these hotels, they, they capitalize on these weekends. So they've got to, they've got to charge. I, I get the point where, Hey, you know, bringing over four kids. We live on the west side of Seattle. It might be easier to to fly down to San Diego. And, you know, if it's around the same price, that might be a little bit more appealing to somebody that's, uh, you know, in Sohomish in, in late November. You know, another aspect was brought up was the 730 games, the Pac-12 after dark. I mean, that it is what it is. I mean, it, TV is running uh, media revenue and getting eyeballs is playing late. So, you know, here's the thing. Last game of the season, November 30th, the Saturday after Thanksgiving weekend, they play at 3.30. There shouldn't be any excuses for this game. They have a, they'll have they probably be anywhere from 15th to 18th in the nation. This is your last opportunity to see this team. They deserve to be sent out uh, properly. And you know what? The Tri-Cities, Spokane, need to be there. 3.30 p.m., there's no excuses for the final game of the week or for the final game of the season. 
obviously, hey, uh, the student section, you know, we don't know what we're going to see from it that that week, the week after Thanksgiving break. But th th there should be 20 to 25,000 Cougs. Obviously, the the alumni side has not looked great either. And, you know, people have brought up the aspect of, hey, well, WSU, WSU needs to invest in hey, maybe getting buses coming in from the Tri-Cities there and back maybe a bus from, you know, buses from Spokane to, to Pullman and, and even the West side. So at this point, there should be no more excuses for this season. Make your way out, see this team against Wyoming, pack the stadium. This could be your last opportunity possibly to see John Mateer in person. Don't want to think about things like that, but there should be no excuse from both sides, the students or the alums going into the final game of the year. My wife and I are currently scheduled to go to the Oregon State game in Corvallis. I think we're going to have to try to add a November 30th to our schedule as well, see if we can make it out for Wyoming. That would be a that would be a big game. All right, now shifting to basketball, the Washington State Cougs start out the year 3 and 0. They've played Portland State, Bradley, and Idaho. First off, Dylan, thank you for forcing me to turn on ESPN Plus and start watching some basketball. This is my first season tuning in to watch some uh, Cougs basketball. And it's been entertaining. There's some studs on this team. What What are your initial thoughts on the first three games of the season? Scoring. We can score. 191 and 90 through your first three games. You beat a very good Bradley team who right now is a quad two victory. So now you have, you know, you're two and oh in, in quad three, quad four games, one and oh in quad two games. But it goes to show you that Cedric Coward only scored four points, only attempted three field goals and you still score 90 points, you beat a team by 23, that just goes to show you that, like, hey, in this style of offense, five out or yeah, with Andy Okafor back, when he's in the game, four out, one in, there's different spacing going on between, you know, when Okafor's in the game and you have Ethan Price and Eric Strupp, who are essentially 6'10 wings, you know, it, it, it goes to show you that, hey, in, in this system, it might not be, you know, the Cedric Coward, the Lawan Watts day it could be the Isaiah Watts day or the Nate Calmese day. But the big thing is we're going to see if, if Riley Ball travels this week. They're going to go play um, in Illinois, which is about an hour from Iowa's campus, a neutral site game. It's going to be heavily attended by Iowa fans. But, you know, this is the type of game that you schedule yourself for where, hey, they're going to be the underdogs going into this game. But this is a chance to really bolster your resume going into West Coast Conference play. So, you know, if this team, you know, they have 12 non-conference games. If they can, it, you know, take an Iowa dub, a Nevada dub, and and get out of conference play ten and two with you know a, a quad one, a couple quad two victories, can see all right, what's it going to take in conference play to get an at large position? Because I just don't see anybody beating uh, Gonzaga in the uh, the the postseason tournament. But after the game, uh, David Riley also said, hey, you know, it, it's great for our offense when you have a guy like Cedric Coward that's going to get the other guys going. But he also said, hey, I, I don't want him taking just three shots a game either. So uh, he's been super passive through his first three games. He's kind of let the scoring come to him when when it happened in game one and game two, because in, in both first halves of the first two games, he was rather quiet and then kind of had, you know, a five to 10 minute stretch where he explodes you know Riley also said after the game where he, we've got a lot of guys on this team that turn into a mini microwave uh you know for you know a two to four minute time of possession where you've got an Isaiah Watts that can you know hit two three threes you've got a Nate Calmes what we saw uh in in game three only had two points in the first half against Idaho and erupted for 14 or 16 in the second half. So the other thing, LaJuan Watts, uh, he is fantastic. He's what I call a super sophomore. He redshirted his first year at Eastern in 2022-23, played last year, was their sixth man, big uh, sky newcomer of the year, averaged around 22 minutes per game. He's now in a starting role here in Washington State. He's going to be playing 30 to 32 minutes, had 12 points, 11 rebounds in the second game. It was his first double double or his second double double of his career. He only had one last year at Eastern and then follows that up with a 16 point, 14 rebound performance. You know, I've seen some comps on Twitter where, you know, he looks like Paul Millsap at Louisiana Tech, a little smaller than Paul. Paul's about six, seven, six, eight. Uh, but I do like that comp. A poor man's Anton Watson who's now with the Celtics, obviously had great years at, at Gonzaga. But I mean, he is your Swiss army knife. You saw him 
you know, take smaller guards into the post. And when he gets into the post with a smaller, uh, smaller opposing player, it's mouse in the house time. And, and Lawan really had a hell of a game and, and really paced us um, at some points defensively and offensively. So that was great to see. Uh, another cool aspect, Marcus Wilson scored his first couple buckets of the season. He had two three-pointers. He was a Kyle Smith recruit. So it's nice to see, hey, you know, Riley was able to keep Parker Garretts and Isaiah Watts and was able to keep Marcus Wilson, who's shown, you know, he's he's got some ability on the defensive end. He's quick. Um, and Riley said post game, it was nice to see him show his other aspects of his game where, you know, he said he can get downhill to the rim. He's got a good outside shot. And yeah, you know, obviously, hey, they he's playing. They didn't redshirt him. So you know, it's crazy. Riley's had, you know, see, see it at Eastern. He'll, he'll go 10, 11 deep on that bench. I mean, he's already done it this year at Wazoo. So really excited for Friday's game against Iowa. It's going to be a true litmus test and we're, we're going to truly see if this offense can travel and uh, you know, the head coach over there, McCaffrey, they have had fantastic offenses. They want to run. So they have no problem with Washington state coming in here and trying to run. You know, if you're a fan of the, uh, the, the over under the over might be a play this week. Yeah. And WCU on the year is averaging 93.7 points on the year. Nate Calmes is leading the team with 17.7 per game. Uh, Luan Watts is leading the team in rebounds per game with 9.7. So there's, there's a lot of different guys that are exciting to watch and, Make sure to tune in on Friday. That game is going to be at 5.30 at Iowa. Being played in Illinois, which it's like 10 miles from the border of Iowa. So that's what you see with these uh, neutral court games. We also have another one where we're not playing in Boise State's home arena, but we're playing in the arena where they're, um, you know, they're, the Idaho Steelhead hockey team plays. Like So the Apple Cup also wasn't played on the University of Washington's campus. And that 10 minutes from it. Well, that'll do it for this week's podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM and leave a comment below on your thoughts of the game against Utah State, the matchup against New Mexico, this basketball team, or anything else, Cougs.